Welcome to this uh, book session. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Cargar for sponsoring our uh, morning coffee break. Uh, this year's panel will be um, about the transition to open access books from a policy perspective. And um, we have three speakers from different European countries, each involved in this um, policy work. And there is Helen Snaith from the UK, Senior Policy Advisor at Research England. There is Jeroen Sonderfang of the Netherlands. Uh, he's project leader for open access at Utrecht University. And there's Tobias Philip from Switzerland, scientific officer of the Swiss National Science Foundation. Each will speak about the work being done in their country. Philip will also and mainly speak about the work being done within Science Europe. And everything you hear here hasn't been publicly said before. This is all new. These reports haven't appeared yet, haven't been published. And so um, it's a kind of a scoop that they come here to the OSPA conference to tell about what they're doing. Um, we thought we'd end these uh, sessions with a discussion about um, how books fit into Plan S. Uh, this is something that is going to be discussed um, a lot in the coming couple of years, ahead of the announcement of the guidelines uh, for books from Coalition S, which are expected to be public towards the end of 2021. Um, if you're interested in this subject, uh, you should know that there will be a conference um, towards the summer of next year, organized by Opera and Ish. Um, and in the meantime, we've been sort of um, preparing for this. Uh, at, at a conference in Marseille last year, um, we, we had a session about setting up an open access books network, and, and it's being developed. Uh, there were a, a number of people involved in this. From the last panel, Margot um, and Rupert and Vanessa. From this panel also, uh, Jeroen and myself. And, and we opened a Slack channel um, called uh, open, oabooks.slack.com. If, you, if you're not registered yet and you're interested, you can, can send me an email and, and we will authorize you to access. Uh, we, we set up a Google Doc to, um, to gather feedback on, on the idea of how books fit into Plan S and, and get your views and um, opinions. And this will feed into the conference that we will be uh, preparing early summer of 2020. So that's um, just ahead. We will we'll come back to the subject after the, the speakers. First, we have um, Helen Snaith. Um, Helen is currently developing an open access policy for books and book chapters for UK research and innovation funded projects and for the REF, the REF After Next, which is the Research Excellence Framework uh, due in 27-28. She's involved in many different working groups for UKRI, for the REF, and for the UUK, the Universities UK. Um, she will present a study, or leave a, 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 um, a data um, study analysis of um, monographs, not just open access monographs, I believe, uh, what we know about books uh, in, in general, and especially the books that are submitted to the REF. So over to you, Helen. Thank you. Um, so, very useful introduction there. I think it's probably useful to actually kind of set out uh, a brief overview of open access monographs and policy in the UK to start with. And I'm coming here today almost with three different hats on. Um, one is as a secretary of Universities UK Open Access Monographs Group. So this was a group that was established in 2016 to monitor and evaluate progress towards open access for books. The second hat is the member of the UK RI Open Access Working Group. Um, so as we've heard over the last few days, UK RI is currently undergoing uh, an internal review of its open access policies with a consultation due to launch next month. And then hat number three, um, I'm also working on developing open access policy for books in the REF after next. Um, so in the UK, we have uh, an exercise called the Research Excellence Framework, and this assesses outputs, impacts, and the research environment of UK universities and takes place roughly every six to seven years. So at the moment, we have a policy that journal articles and conference proceedings that are returned to the REF have to comply with an open access policy. 
um, but embargo periods can, can apply for that. So we're now looking then to extend that policy to include books and book chapters for the REF after next. Um, and as part of the UKRI Open Access Review as well, books and book chapters are also in scope of that policy. So a few things to note then when we're thinking about developing open access for books, uh, particularly in relation to Plan S. Um, the first is UKRI is a signatory of Plan S. Um, and as we heard from Johan yesterday, monographs haven't been looked at um, in that great amount of detail with regard to Plan S, although it is something that they're interested in looking at the long term. Um, so this is something, you know, it's, it's quite a pivotal moment here, and if we're thinking about what, what steps to take in order to inform what a Plan S policy might look like around books, I think we're, we're kind of putting those, those stones down to, to start moving towards that. I think there's an important distinction to note as well around the UKRI Open Access Review and the REF Open Access Review. So Research England sits in between the two groups. Uh, the REF is governed by the UK for UK higher education funding bodies. So we're obviously going to be seeking policy commonality across a REF Open Access Policy and a UKRI Open Access Policy as far as it is possible. But we will be having a separate REF consultation next year and that will build on the, the, the outcomes of the UKRI policy. So to inform these reviews then, uh, the UK Open Access Monograph Group have, we've pub got published two reports at the moment with one forthcoming. So Tuesday the 8th of October is a date for your diaries. I um, unfortunately couldn't publish it for this week, but I've been told that next couple of weeks and we can get our work out there. So the report one uh, published July 2018, and this was very much looking at a literature review um, and significant developments and activities uh, in open access monograph publishing. Report number two was published in March earlier this year, and this was a discussion of the, some of the engagement events that the University's UK group had carried out, um, and these were reflecting on events co-hosted with the Arts and Humanities Alliance and which, with the Publish Publishers Association. So really aiming at starting a dialogue with learned societies and subject associations as well as publishers and not just talking about kind of uh, commercial publishers but thinking about scholar-led publishers, new university uh, presses as well, trying to understand the a diverse publishing ecology in order to cater for that kind of diversity in a policy. Report number three then, so this is very much um, an evidence review of what the, the, the study that we've kind of collected so far, so reflecting again on the engagement uh, event and also having a look at um, a data analysis carried out by full stop and this is some work they've been doing over the last 12 months. And it's this third and yet unpublished report that I wanted to focus on today. So providing you with the, with the scoop, so to speak. And I think it's then useful to think about how these findings and I suppose what I'm going to talk about today might inform the way that we think about a policy for books. Okay, so one of the questions in the, U the UK group put to full stop was how a policy actually might define what an academic monograph is um, and whether or not there are differences between types of books, so for example trade books um, or a standard academic monograph. So trade book we could consider as a book grounded in original scholarly research but is perhaps expected to generate more sales, has a broader public appeal in comparison to an academic monograph which might typically sell around 200 to 300 copies. So using the data returned to the last REF exercise, which took place in 2014, <laughs> Full Stop found that there was over 12,700 unique titles returned to social sciences and the arts humanities panels. So these are panels C and panels D. So of these 12,700 titles, um, over 10,700 were tagged by Nielsen as general or trade. Um, so no, they were tagged as general or trade or higher education or further education. So we're identifying the ones which have been tagged. 26% of those that did have a tag were tagged as general and trade. Um, intuitively, uh, the, kind of the steering group respond to that saying that, that that feels quite high, you know, 
almost a quarter of all the books that were returned to social sciences, arts and humanities, we're not sure if, if they're, they're trade, they might be more standard academic. So we kind of went back to the data and had a look at, at price points of those trade books. And we found that there were variances in price. So, for example, some of those books that were tagged as general or trade were priced at around 100, 110, 120 pounds, which doesn't really say to me that's a trade book. Um, so we then I asked for stop then to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that and have a look then at kind of some different price points. So the screen above you shows then, so 9% were tagged as general and under 20 pounds, 3% tagged as general and under 10 pounds. So there's massive variances then um, in what is tagged and actually those price points. And of course, if we're thinking about, I suppose, what separates a trade book and an academic book when considering policy, price isn't the only thing to consider, nor is, you know, how Nielsen tags uh, books uh, necessarily always reliable. So after speaking with a few trade publishers, you know, they've mentioned around differences in marketing and distribution for trade books, uh, the number of print runs, and actually discussions can start fairly early on the writing and research process and actually to identify what kind of books will have a broader public appeal. And this is very much a discussion then that, that happens between the author and the publisher. So as part of the full stop study, we were also interested in publisher sale trends and library book acquisitions. Um, they found that 70% of publisher sales take place in the first two years after publication, 80% of sales taking place in the first three years. And this is followed kind of by a long tail of sales then. Um, when we're thinking about what this might mean, um, you know, do the sales pattern then inform our way of thinking around a potential for a delayed open access model? And that's not just saying a delayed with what we might think is typical, maybe embargoed and green, but actually delayed with the full publisher version being available at the end of a set period. Library book acquisition budgets as well. Um, so 13, 13 libraries gave us data um, on, the, on their acquisition trends. Um, and 50% are used to purchase front list titles. So that's titles published since 2016. Around 15%, which is around roughly 8.4 million, is spent on acquiring deep, deep backlist titles. This is titles published more than 10 years ago. Um, and I think that figure was really interesting to me because I suppose there is there a potential for open access then to change that kind of behavior. And I think this is something that we almost need to keep on coming back to in the open access discussion and the extent to which an open access, books being made open access, um, has the potential to change library purchasing patterns. Um, and I suppose that's almost a bit of an unknown space at the moment. However, if we're thinking about those deep black backlist titles, you know, we, I think it would be naive to say, look, there's some money in the system because, you know, there's always going to be a preference for print books. Uh, publishers rely on the revenue from backlist titles. Conversion of backlist titles, we wanted to explore that route, would take investment. So it's not as, as easy as saying, look, here's some money. We were also interested to understand more about the role of publishers outside of the UK. Um, during the engagement events, there was a very strong message from academics and from publishers about the importance of say, academics publishing with an American university press or authors publishing with maybe a small niche, uh, niche specialist publisher based in Europe. Um, there are, this was kind of a very strong message that we heard from academics. Um, so the study found that 14% of the books returned to the ref 2014 were published with a press based in the US. 78% um, of the presses were actually based in the UK. So that is quite a high number. Anthropology had the highest percentage of books published with the US press. That's over a quarter of some 200 books returned. However, English literature and language and history had the highest number of books published with the US press. Modern languages and linguistics, um, unsurprisingly, is the most international discipline in terms of the location of the publisher, with 21% of outputs published with the press outside of the UK. And there are some real disciplinary differences that came through in full stops analysis. Um, so for example, 92% you know, of law titles were published with a press based in the UK. Um, so it's very you know, discipline specific. 
And with regards to international co-authorship then, there were 174 titles returned to the last ref were co-authored by a scholar affiliated with a US institution. I think the second highest uh, country with co-authorship was then behind the US was Australia. So that's the REF. So I've already said already that we're talking about UKRI and the REF, and I think it's interesting to almost pull out some figures then when we want to understand the number of different outputs that we might be talking about when we're talking about an open access policy for books and for edited collections. Um, so UKRI analysts have pulled some information on publications linked to grants from one of the seven subject councils, and this is from 2008 to 2018. And there are some certain caveats when interpreting this data. Um, so for example, the, the system that's, the platform that's used to capture it, um, it's, it's, it's somewhat patchy, people entering kind of different uh, publisher names or different spellings, different variations of. There was only compulsory to complete the data um, since 2012 onwards, so anything before that time might be slightly incomplete. But the numbers are an indication of what we might be looking at going forward. So as you wouldn't be surprised to see that AHRC and ESRC, so these are arts and humanities and economics and social sciences, uh, dominate books and monographs. And frustratingly, the system uses to capture the information between books and monographs doesn't differentiate between the two. Um, EPSRC has a high number of book chapters. So this is engineering and physical sciences. Um, and this is something that the British Academy, um, based in the UK, are having a look at at the moment and understanding uh, trends across book chapters that are linked to these grants. And although the EP EPSRC has the highest number of book chapters, as a proportion of the outputs they're actually publishing, it's very, very small. <coughs> Thinking then about how these numbers compare to the REF and I suppose I'm kind of drawing on books, the number of books, the number of edited collections, the number of book chapters. Um, there are, so we've already said there are already 12,700 unique titles returned to panel C and D. Um, around 2,000 of these are edited collections, so the majority of them are your kind of your academic monograph. Um, separately then there are around 14,500 book chapters and this varies across subject areas to so how many book chapters are returned, and that depends again on discipline norms. But I think one of the most interesting things from the full stop study for me was that the, the, the benchmark for open access books being returned at the moment is very, very low. Um, so there's only 46 books that were returned to social sciences and to the arts and humanities panel in the last ref are open access. And that's not even to say that they were available open access when they were submitted, because some of them have been made open access a couple of years after. So for example, using um, Knowledge and Latched. Um, and then of the long form publications returned to the REF that were linked to a research council grant, just five were linked to either an AHRC or to an ESRC grant. So we're starting off really, really, really small. Um, and I am suppose I'm looking forward then to the results from the next exercise to actually see how that changes. Um, and I would expect kind of based on conversations today, conversations that have taken place over the next, over the last 12 to 18 months, that that figure would, would grow quite considerably. So if we're thinking then what might a policy for open access monographs actually look like? And I'm drawing on here on a workshop that UKRI ran um, on open access and monographs a couple of weeks ago. And um, kind of drawing on some of those key messages and key themes that came through. It needs to be simple, um, you know, avoiding, I suppose, technical terminology and things that authors and, and professional research staff don't understand. Uh, it needs to be flexible. We need to account for different routes to open access. We need to account for uh, the diversity of book publishing, um, respecting bibliodiversity and the different types of outputs that people might have. It needs to be forward-looking and future-proof. And I suppose this is something that we need to think about when it comes to policy implementation dates and respecting the longitudinal nature of monograph, uh, writing, researching, and publishing, and recognizing that this is a process that 
takes, you know, five, six, seven years. And this is a, this is a huge part of an author's life and for the pub publisher's life. Um, so in order to have a, have a policy, we've kind of got to look beyond that and say, where do we want to be in 15 years? I think we see policy compliance through various routes. Um, yes, book processing charges, part of that, but also consortium models, freemium, delayed open access, I've already mentioned. Um, there is no one size fits all, and this, this phrase comes up quite a bit with open access books. I think it's also important that we move away from green and gold terminology. Um, you know, does this work for books? Does this work for arts, humanities, and social sciences? I think we're at almost a pivotal moment for open access books and actually before we move forward let's think about what kind of terminology and what kind of phrasing we want to surround ourselves in. So next steps, um, so what's the UK going to be doing over the next 12 months? So we've got the publication of the university's UK report um, alongside the full stop data analysis and this will have recommendations for stakeholders um, including so libraries, publishers, funders, policy makers, as well as the scholarly community as a whole. What can we do as a collective? I think that's really important. The UKRI Open Access Review uh, consultation will be published in autumn 2019, and the REF, UK, the REF Open Access Review then will kind of build on top of that and will take place next year. And we also heard today, uh, Research England have also funded 2.2 million to COPIM, and that's to have a look at community-led infrastructures. I think as a final note, I think it's, it's almost worth iterating that there is a real opportunity with open access book publishing to recognise the diversity and the value of the monograph within the arts, humanities and the social sciences. Um, and I think this is, this is a good thing. And I see I suppose, a lot of opportunities with open access books to reinforce this value. Thank you, Helen. Um, I think we, we just will do all the presentations. If you have a, a specific question for Helen now, um, I don't see a hand coming up, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, next, we, we will hear from Jeroen Sondervan. Jeroen uh, leads, in open access, um, leads open access for the Open Science Program in the University of Utrecht. He used to work in scholarly publishing um, as a commissioning editor at Amsterdam University Press and with other presses. His focus has been on open access um, forever. He um, specializes in film and media studies. Um, he's still uh, involved in that area of, of media studies and um, he launched a preprint server, Medi Archive, I think it's called. Um, he's a member of Knowledge Exchange um, of the Open Access Working Group and of the Open Access Working Group um, of the Dutch Library Consortium. He will talk about the work being done um, within the national platform uh, in the Netherlands for open science. Is this working? Yes. Um, so thank you, Ilko, for uh, this introduction and thank you, Ospa, for in inviting us and this panel to have this panel. Um, so I will be talking about developing a policy here for open access books in the context of the national platform Open Science. The national platform Open Science, I will explain it later in my presentation. Um, it is basically um, the most important stakeholders in higher education in the Netherlands joining forces to come up with uh, an open science program and uh, to install policy and, and, and work on, on the progress of open access, open data and rewards and incentives. Um, the, um, um, the presentation is also online uh, with clickable links and extra so uh, resources. So um, just to mention that you can follow um, live. Um, so, but first, where do we come from in the Netherlands? So I want to show you some examples of what has been happening on OA Books uh, for quite a while now, starting 2008, 2009. Um, that's the OAPEN project. We have the director here at the table. Um, it was uh, a, a European Union funded uh, project um, to build an infrastructure for open access books. 
On the right side, publishers, AUP was um, one of the six university presses involved in building that platform. And we did also a project, OAPEN NL, and um, we had several successors, uh, OAPEN.UK um, and OAPEN in Switzerland, both at the table. Um, and we looked at uh, costing and, and, and how to progress in uh, open, uh, open access books, but then for the Dutch uh, presses. On the right side, you see a couple of, I listed a few. There are many more, of course. Um, smaller ones, but also bigger ones. Uh, Springer, for instance, is not on this list, but is active on, on the Dutch market, of course. Uh, we have in the humanities Amsterdam University Press, um, Brill, a big publisher, um, a large output of monographs. We have University of Groningen Press, started recently, two years ago, um, actively um, engaging with open access monographs as well. Uh, Leiden University Press, small one. Um, John Benjamins is offering open access options. So in the Netherlands, there are uh, quite a few, um, of quite, a large amount of publishers are already engaging with open access and offering open access solutions. So open science or open scholarship, um, let's not debate about that here. Um, so the context, um, what, what uh, uh, we, we have different levels now in the Netherlands uh, working on, on open science policy. So on the left side, this is this national plan or platform open science. I will come back to that later. Uh, addressing these five main topics. Uh, in the middle, we have the Dutch Research Council. We in the Netherlands have only one research council, NWO. Um, also a secondary, uh, secondary of, of Plan S. Um, focusing on, on, on uh, open access books, uh, so, sorry, open access publishing, uh, the data. Uh, and also now working on um, recognition and rewarding. Um, and NWO already has an open access policy in place for, uh, I think, 2007, 2008. Um, they also had an incentive fund to uh, support open access books. So this is long on the, has been long on the agenda, um, and there were already solutions um, uh, offer, offered. And on the right side, we now have, so Utrecht University, uh, my own university, uh, we are engaging with open access for a long period now. Um, but now, since uh, this year, starting this year, we have an open science program, which means that we are working on different aspects of open science. Um, these are the main topic, topics on the right side, uh, below the, the, the logo. Um, and we will be addressing open access books um, in a specific work package, um, but I will show you uh, uh, what we are doing, um, what we will be doing uh, later on. So, and then of course, uh, uh, Helen already mentioned Plan S. Um, this is um, coming. Uh, monographs are not being neglected, but sort of um, no, delayed. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly what will be happening with, with monographs. Um, it is now in the newest guidelines being said that after 2021 we should have something in place on monograph policy within the context of Plan S. Uh, this is of course um, with a research council, NWO, being a signatory, a very important aspect of developing a policy for, for open access books for, uh, for the Dutch um, uh, context. So, um, just to show you a few examples, there are many more. Um, what is happening now on an institutional level, uh, on the left side, Tilburg University also has an open science program, a three-year program in place, looking at open access books, experimenting with uh, self-publishing, for instance, um, uh, supporting researchers uh, in experimenting, um, and also open access books is, uh, is uh, uh, part of the agenda. And on the right side, um, uh, this is uh, literally a quote from the Open Science Program, contribute to the development of open access for monographs and edited volumes supporting promising initiatives and performing research into sustainable open access for books. And what I've been doing now for this um, policy development within the, is of course uh, a part of this. Um, and I should say that um, in the Netherlands we have a few universities, I think three from the back of my head, uh, Utrecht and Delft uh, um, uh, run the, an, an open access fund um, and it's available for researchers to, uh, uh, to reimburse um, BPC costing. Um, 
And then something about the context, uh, the National Plan Open Science. Um, maybe you've heard of it and maybe you don't, but uh, it's already two years ago that um, main stakeholders in the higher education, so the Research Council, the Royal Academy of Sciences, the Federation of Dutch Universities, um, uh, and many more, also the Library Consortium, have signed this National Plan Open Science to move forward with these topics on the left side. So 100% open access ambition, reuse of data, etc., the recognition research, researchers, uh, and citizen science, um, and encouraging open science, so uh, awareness programs. Um, and in this context, um, it is um, in this declaration, you can call it a declaration or uh, a, a, a plan to move forward, um, this is literally a quote from the, uh, the plan. Scientific publications, articles, parts of books, reports that are funded with public money can be consulted and reused directly from anywhere in the world for anyone to access. And we have set ourselves a deadline by the end of 2020. And now the biggest challenge uh, for us, for the, um, the NPOS uh, policy uh, working group is uh, we have a lack of concrete measure, measures and an implementation plan for books. Um, as you may know, in the Netherlands, we have this uh, for four years now, this read and publish deals um, for journals. Um, and, and, and we are looking at other uh, uh, possibilities to enhance open access for articles. But up till now, well, yeah, recently, a few months ago, half a year ago, uh, books were sort of not on the agenda. Um, so this is a real challenge for us to speed up things. Um, I'm looking at Eelco, but he is also part of the policy working group. Um, uh, yeah, so we have a risk that uh, when we have this 2020 deadline, uh, nothing has happened for books uh, in time. So um, we have little time. So it's, all, no, it's one year and three, four months. Um, and we're now middle, in the middle of doing research, drafting a policy paper uh, which will go to the board of the, the platform within a month. So I can't you present to you the, the exact things in there because the board needs to see it first. Um, but I can show you something, uh, some, some, some data. Uh, we did, of course, some uh, initial research on, uh, on the topic. Um, the group is very small, as you can see. We have only four people to be very <coughs> agile and speedy with this process and we of course make use of uh, expertise coming from different uh, colleagues in the Netherlands um, at libraries but also other stakeholders. So Hans de Jonge who is also here, I think he's over there from the Research Council, uh, Astrid van Wezenbeek from the Royal Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, sorry the National Library of the Netherlands and myself and Ilko as external advisor. So starting points for the policy brief we're now drafting is how we take this, no, yeah, f maybe you've seen it before, um, the, 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 the definition, and we can have a long discussion, we have had long discussions with several, uh, during several meetings about what an academic book is, but we started with this, a long academic and peer-reviewed work written on a scientific topic that is usually written by one or, few, or, or a few authors. And for now, because we want to move quickly, we now focus on only uh, the, the academic peer-reviewed book. So we are now excluding in the policy brief uh, theses, for instance. We in the Netherlands have a long OA policy for theses um, uh, that should be deposited uh, in a repository. Um, chapters, I will come back to that later, because we might have a solution in our copyright law. Uh, textbooks and non-fiction trade books. But we will consider along the way, uh, looking at the other uh, textbooks, for instance, or trade books, how we can deal with this, these categories. So we did a quick scan of what uh, is available on data availab availability. Um, so looking at registered data from the research information systems from the, from the, the universities. Uh, which is also being collected on a national level um, and, and being collected by the, the Federation of the Dutch Universities. We did a quick sign of the publication landscape in the Netherlands, what is happening, uh, what is happening with the BPC, 
the book publication charges policies on an institutional level or with publishers, and um, where do authors uh, publish, and then, of course, uh, something about the, the, the costing. So, and this could, it is depressing, maybe. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at the academic monograph, peer-reviewed book, um, uh, and the, the, the yearly output by all universities. And the Federation has 14 universities, but we have 13 research-intensive universities. The other one is more focused on open education. education. Um, so this is data from the 13 research universities. And um, as you can see on the 2017 mark, we have, uh, it is a declining figure. And this is, this is also a question we've been raising uh, during the, the talks. Um, yeah, this is a trend. Um, you would expect that, we've also looked at the book chapters, that we were expecting to have uh, uh, um, uh, the other way around, so more chapter publishing, but this is also very, varying very much. And we need to look into this, the why, um, and that's something we, uh, we uh, um, uh, will do for the next um, uh, term um, or the next year. And then something about uh, the categories, and um, this also shows, uh, and I'll come back to that later, that the data itself is, um, as it is now, not, no, if not it, it, is use, it, it is useful, but it has its flaws. Um, and there is a, a huge variety, for instance, the yellow one. Um, we need to look into these details to, to see how we can, um, um, no, go into depth, uh, but also um, see how we can get this data um, in a better shape. So, and uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Jeroen Bosman and uh, Bianca Kramer, they did a research uh, for the Federation of Universities looking at the publication landscape and publication cultures. So, um, what other types than only the articles uh, do we have? And um, this is a summary of what is happening with uh, books and where authors are publishing their um, uh, books. So this is a collection of monographs and chapters, I should say, for only 2017 and only for Utrecht University. Um, there is a link to the report uh, where th there's many more uh, uh, data being collected. I won't go into detail now because it's really uh, uh, data heavy and, and, and graphs and etc. Cetera, et cetera. But it's an, it's an interesting study for us and for the policy group uh, to have a clear sense of uh, what is happening. Um, and in the humanities, um, the, the, the largest part, uh, the so social sciences and the arts and humanities, Taylor and Francis is, is the biggest, string of nature. And then the smaller ones, Amsterdam University Press, and then the more Dutch-based uh, humanities publishers come into place. Um, pre preparing this, this document, um, We've been looking at costs, uh, and we started with this paper uh, by Martin Eve and Graham Stone and a few others, um, looking at a, um, uh, what the average cost of, of um, uh, a monograph um, uh, is at the moment. And they came up with this um, average of this 7,500 um, uh, so, oh yeah, pounds, yeah. So, translated into uh, the 8474 euros. Um, and we did the same for uh, the Netherlands. Um, so on average, um, uh, we uh, uh, came up with the average between the UK and the Netherlands uh, is approximately 8,000. Um, and if you extrapolate this to the the output, which is more or less now expected to be uh, 700 books, that would mean if we would have an, an, an immediate uh, BPC uh, uh, focused model in place, this would imply a costing of approximately 5.6 million, which isn't there. So we need to look at different uh, ways of uh, achieving OA for, for monographs. But this is just a model we've been using now um, and we will look into uh, this more detailed, uh, of course, in the, in the second round. Um, and then something about, I was mentioning the chapters. Um, this is a pilot 
we have been running from January to August. You share, we take care. It was organized also by the Federation of Universities. Um, we have this copyright amendment um, in, a, in, the, in the copyright law, um, um, which says, and it is now in effect from 2015, and it says that the maker, a scholar in this, in this case, is able to open up his work or her work after a reasonable period of time. Um, and that's typically Dutch, I think. What is a reasonable period of time? We don't know. We say this and it's up to you to uh, make it work. Um, instead of what's happening in, for instance, Belgium or France, where it's clear what the reasonable amount of time is. So for the HSS, Humanity Social Sciences, it's six, uh, 12 months embargo. And um, uh, in, in uh, uh, France, it's the same, I think. So also six for the SDM and 12 months for the humanities and social sciences. So it's, it's clear. But we thought that this pilot is needed to um, have a clear idea of what is meant by a reasonable period of time. So we opened this pilot for researchers to be able to submit their papers in a repository, institutional repository. And I, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's large. So, but with the, um, um, we'll share the published version after six months across the board for all disciplines, and it's also for the version of record, um, which also differs from, for instance, what is possible in Belgium and in France. So, and we opened this also for chapters, because in this pilot we considered, and this is debatable, of course, um, but we considered chapters to be a short scientific work. So in this case, we have an instrument, although it's delayed, um, to uh, um, open up, um, uh, in this case, uh, book chapters. So some issues. Um, what we've seen is that there is a lack of alignment and in, also in definitions of output types, which are registered in, in the research information systems. And we need to address this um, uh, urgently because uh, otherwise we can't do uh, any data analysis um, uh, in a good way. Um, and then the national ambitions, already set in 2013, are really focused on immediate OA. Um, so green OA is, uh, in some cases, and that institutional, institutional uh, policy is an option, but the national ambitions are really focused on this. So this is also an issue we need to take into account. Cost transparency, that's um, being mentioned several times. Um, and on the APC uh, market, you see this already happening with Frontiers and eLife. Uh, but on the BPC market, uh, many things are happening and we uh, don't have a clear idea of uh, how BPCs are being, uh, can, can be uh, um, um, broke down. And, and then, of course, awareness, uh, author engagement, and that's also something I see at the Utrecht University. Um, many authors don't know their way or they don't know about open access books at all. So this is important. And of course, and I guess that's something for the discussion maybe, there's no clear vision on what's, what will be happening with the implementation guidelines of PANES. So this is also very um, of influence of what we will be doing next year. So shortly, next steps. We have formulated a, a, a policy brief, which will go to the, the EMPOL stakeholders uh, next month. This is the, in, the first step. Uh, we did some recommendations. So formulate policy uh, and implement, hopefully, by the end of 2020. Consider making funding available for making books OA, and consider, consider also setting up a joint fund. And for BPC funding, but also for infrastructural funding. Um, and then pay more attention to communication with researchers and clearly state the benefits of open access publishing of books. And I'm done. Thank you, Jon. Uh, next we have Tobias Philipp. Uh, Tobias coordinates implementation of the open access policy at the Swiss National Science Foundation. He's a member of Science Europe's Open Access Working Group, and he'll talk about both, both the work done within Science Europe and the policy developed within SNSF. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm presenting the Science Europe briefing paper on open access to academic books, which is available for well, two hours right now 
on the Science Zero website. So you're the first to um, be presented this live that were not included in writing the paper itself. I also have some versions of this in print actually available here, which you can pick up later on. So just some introduction on who was behind this publication before I go through the structure and the arguments we make so you can better gauge um, what's the idea behind it. So it's a joint effort of a Science Europe working group on open access. Science Europe, 37 member organizations from 28 European countries, research funders as well as research performers, and Science Europe advocates science and the scientific community. Within this working group, we had a task group that produced this um, briefing paper, uh, members from the Swiss National Science Foundation, also Angela Holzer from the German um, Research Foundation, Olaf Siegert from Leibniz, and Jean-Claude Kita from the Belgian FNRS were involved. The first question, of course, why a Science Europe briefing paper on academic books and open access to them. So the first important argument, which was uh, luckily already made on the first day of this conference, is that open access must extend to all formats of academic publications. So the benefits of open access obviously apply irrespective of a publishing format. From my perspective as a funder, and as a funder who spends public money, and we demand open access to the results of uh, the work the taxpayer made possible, so this claim does not end if we achieve 100% open access to articles, so books are just a mandatory aspect we have to address. The briefing paper aims at providing directions to develop book policies. It aims at pointing out key issues at stake, specific differences between books as compared to articles in the article market, and provides principles to underpin developing policies for open access books and recommends what six different stakeholders involved here can do. It is also not an isolated document since the working group on open access within Science Europe was quite uh, productive in the previous years. So namely, it complements the Science Europe principles on open access to research publications, the Science Europe briefing paper on open access business models and current trends in the open access publishing system, and the Science Europe recommendations for the disclosure of publication fees. The first part of the briefing paper tries to summarize challenges and opportunities in um, the landscape of publishing academic books, which we have learned today is a very diverse landscape. Diverse means we often have nationally oriented, far smaller markets for academic books, we have books being published in other languages than English, so national languages, or in the case of Switzerland and other European countries, multiple languages. Less market concentration on a few large multinationals, many small and medium-sized publishers, many different publishing models that are run to finance these operations. So it is obvious from the start that there will be no one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to academic books. Also, um, authors and publishers alike grapple with costs of putting out academic books. Cost in this case means authors, especially junior researchers, are often already used to having to find the funds to pay for publishing their um, books in closed access today. Academic book publishers, on the other hand, often hardly cover the costs to produce academic books, and there's a lot of cross-financing taking place. And in many countries, the academic book, book, uh, academic book publishing is already depending on external subsidies from, for example, public funders or public foundations. On the other hand, as we have, uh, as we have also learned in the previous panel, the landscape is constantly in involving, evolving. And there are a lot of um, small, medium-sized, agile actors on the field. And open access could improve the situation for all involved, researchers, funders, and publishers alike. But again, it is crucial to make authors want to publish open access, so working on the cultural change to enable them to do so and 
feel the benefits themselves is highly important. And I used the, the biggest four I had available in this slide for this last sentence and to address one misunderstanding we had to fight when in Switzerland we introduced um, open access for books policy. Open access does not prohibit anyone from printing a book. Open access means the digital version has to be openly available. It does not mean a publisher must not print a book. This can happen, this should happen. This is something people really need and want and books will be continued to, read, to be read on paper. So we have five principles we go into in the, the principal paper. The first one, um, explicit open access policies. Everyone involved needs to be explicit and explicitly include all formats of scholarly publication, including books. The policy must apply to the first digital copy, since that is the time when open access, in our sense, is actually achieved. Full and immediate open access should be recommended or required. If delayed open access is accepted, we propose an embargo period for books of 12 months. Since we are um, of the opinion that the vast majority of sales happens in the first uh, year, as we have, for example, encountered in the OAPNCH pilot project we did in Switzerland, also in line with the OAPN study done in the Netherlands. Any open access policy has also to factor in the diversity of the academic book market and be open to change and innovative publishing formats since that is right now um, a time where a lot of um, different approaches are tried and are happening in an open access policy, including books, should be flexible enough to accommodate that. Funding and business models. So there is no one ideal road to go. This is why we are not able to have one single principle. But publisher services and prices have to be fully transparent and publicly available to anyone interested in them. Funding calculations for open access books should be limited to the first digital copy. Existing funds to support print publications and acquire books should partly be redirected. And again, printed books remain relevant and should still be offered by publishers. Infrastructure to monitor the development is also one important point. To actually put this price transparency to good use. So um, a monitoring is recommended and has to take into account the diversity of books and publishing models uh, used. So this uh, monitoring of open access books will likely be more complex than, for example, open APC is today. Quality assurance. We all know reputation is key in science and in the scientific publishing system. So quality assurance mechanisms used by publishers must be clear, transparent, documented, and easy to access. Funding models for academic books should at least cover copy editing as a minimum standard of formal quality assurance. And a review of the book should be done by independent experts and be based on the complete manuscript and not only an abstract. Authors and their institutions should retain copyright on the content published in academic books and books should be published preferably under a CC BY license but more restrictive Creative Commons licenses might also be chosen if needed. Dissemination and discoverability is of course deeply intertwined with the promise of open access that is so connected to the discoverability of open access publications. So complete metadata must be provided and follow common standards. Archiving needs to be done on the national or international level. So involve, for example, national libraries who often ha already have a duty to archive um, cultural and scientific publications from their respective countries. And vital infrastructures should be open, transparent, and community governed, for example, for hosting, metadata enhancement, preservation, aggregation, deposit, and so on, 
uh, we mention as an example the directory of open access books and the OAPEN library, which we, for example, also use in Switzerland. We formulate recommendations for stakeholders and what they can do. And we have six different stakeholders in the paper. And again, have to stress the need for a collective effort. And I've sorted the stakeholders around the researchers in the center. So what funders and research performing organizations need to create is a suitable environment for open access books. So obviously an explicit policy that includes them. And the second point, very important for open access in general, reconsider academic incentive and reward mechanisms in order to assess research on its own merits, and specifically for books, to recognize quality assurance work. When we start recommending that a review for a book to be published in open access is done on the whole book, and not just an abstract, this is of course a huge amount of work, and we have to find a way to value this effort spent by researchers. Funders and performing organizations should also reserve part of the budget to develop and maintain infrastructure supporting open access books and be prepared to share data on prices of book publishing. Funders in particular should consider to set up separate funding instruments to enable funding for open access books beyond the duration of grants and also to monitor the, tr the transition. This is specifically important for books since um, it takes a lot of time to write a book and hardly any book will be done and get published during the runtime of the grant that finance the research um, that it ends up representing. If that's not possible, funding for open access books must at least be part of grants. Of course, funders should also require transparent quality assurance processes together and in cooperation with scientific communities to be sure to fund only quality publications. Research performing organizations are closer to the researchers themselves. So we recommend them to develop and expand training mechanisms to stimulate the cultural change we need and to raise awareness for open access and the offerings um, the landscape has developed so far. Research organizations also should retain copyright unless the authors can do so on an individual level themselves. Now we get closer to the researchers, libraries. They, of course, operate in close relationship um, with the researchers themselves. They are the ones who answer most of the questions. They should be enabled to provide support and training, to think about repurposing part of the acquisition budget towards open access books, be transparent about price developments, and ensure that the discoverability of open access books is possible in their systems, include them in their catalogs, and so on. Everything revolves around the researchers. Support for OA books is coming from them in almost all roles as authors, editors, reviewers, and we recommend them to start considering and comparing open access services provided to them, since all this transparency is nothing we demand um, as something institutions can profit from, but in the end, we want researchers to profit from transparency. So they should start considering services provided to communicate the need for assistance and support to their institutions, to demand Creative Commons licenses, and insist on keeping copyright. Learned societies also play an important role, so they should, in the first place, think about adapting their own portfolios to open access. And they play an important role in exploring and enhancing quality assurance mechanisms and represent them, um, which are fitted to the specific disciplinary community those learned societies represent. Finally, publishers also have a lot to gain when it comes to transitioning the book market to open access. So they should seize new opportunities, exchange best practices as right now, right here, and start providing transparent information on open access offerings they have, including explicitly the services they provide to authors, actively communicate those services, and also 
um, educate authors in making it obvious which self-archiving rights they have in a transitional period to open access to books in general. My last slide is one example from Switzerland. Um, it turned out that one way to really agitate Swiss researchers is to touch anything about publishing an academic book in general. They're very sensitive to this, and I guess it's the same in other countries. So one way the SNSF decided to take, to put open access to books forward was conducting the pilot study already mentioned by APNCH from 2014 to 2017. And we had 12 publishers involved from Switzerland, Germany, and France. We had 82 researchers involved who were surveyed, who were interviewed, and we went with them through the process of getting books open access. And based on these results, the SNSF introduced a new funding instrument for open access to books, um, book processing charges, which are modular, which are based on the researcher's needs and the services provided, and which also take into account the um, pricing publishers in Switzerland and those publishers our authors actually work with need to provide the services at the level we want. So since April 2018, we were able to fund 186 books already in um, this new BPC model, and we consider it a big success. Um, researchers as well as publishers are highly satisfied. So in my opinion, that's one positive, positive example of um, achieving open access to books on a national level in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. So now we come to the, the last part, which is a discussion around um, Plan S, really, for books. Um, I, I, I invite you to take part in this, so if you have a, a remark to make or a question to ask, please uh, raise your arm. Um, but first I will start with uh, a couple of questions uh, for the panel. Um, and um, the last question will be about what we can do in the coming couple of years, what is important to do to, um, to work towards this transition to open access for, for books. But first, um, I will ask you um, a question about how Plan S can support open access for books, or you know, if, it's, if it's not really Plan S that you are thinking about when you want to make this transition, how do you see books fitting into the, the Plan S approach? So I'll start with uh, the far end, I think, if that's all right, Jeroen. <laughs> It's, it is work. They're both working. Ah, yes, now it is. Yeah. Um, so what can we do as a um, community at large to enhance open access books, but also in the context of Plan S? Um, for me, it's... So when, when Plan S was launched um, last year, during OASPA, by the way, um, I've I found it uh, rather disappointing that monographs were uh, being dealt with with only one sentence. Um, we agree that, uh, that this is, this is a, a format uh, and we, we need to take it into account, but and then um, uh, it, 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 it went um, fake. So, and I, I uh, have been in the Netherlands at least at some uh, occasions and events. Um, uh, also with um, sco humanity scholars, and there was a lot of debate about uh, had, because of this fakeness. So I think, and with the new guidelines um, saying that there will be a uh, policy implemented um, starting from 2021, but I think that for the coalition it's really important to engage with, in this case, mainly humanities and social science scholars now. Um, um, because there, there is a um, anxiety in, in, in many cases, um, I think, uh, be, because of the unclearness, what will be happening, uh, what do I need to do. Um, so I think engagement with researchers is really important uh, coming from, from Coalition S and not now only talk about the journals 
and the articles, but now take along the books already in this uh, discussion. I think that's really uh, important. So from Coalition S, a call to engage with researchers to, to uh, make them part of the discussion now. Okay. Thanks. Um, moving over to Tobias. Maybe I start with what has Plan S already done for books, which is bringing attention to open access as a topic. So it's not that much interesting as a topic to someone not dealing with it directly. And I've, I'm personally not aware of any other approach that made it into the mainstream media. And this also made it obvious for someone who went into the details that um, publishing doesn't end with an article. So this one sentence was little, mm -hmm. but at least it was there. It was aware that uh, this is not finished. So the first thing I think is bringing books and the question of open access to them to attention. And the second one is um, generating an influx of ideas and positions since um, the book landscape is more diverse as uh, the article landscape. And I think it should stay more diverse since it's, it's, uh, it's serving a diverse community and it's doing this in a good way that we should somehow open up. I have no idea how to do this and I'm quite sure nobody in Coalition S right now has an idea how to do this. But um, for the future of open access books, in Plan S, I would think there will again be the need for a lot of dialogue to find a common ground. Thank you, Helen. I think I'll just add to those points, and uh, I suppose coming back to the presentation, I think a policy for um, open access books has to be clear that it is not just replicating a policy for journals. Um, books occupy a very distinct space for arts, humanities and social science scholars. And I think this importance around communicating to researchers, I mean, what we found as part of the Universities UK group through various um, engagement exercises, is that there's a real need for actually institutional leadership um, and for someone to kind of, at a university level, to drive this forward with academics. Um, and it's kind of a whole, a whole host of questions bound up with that. I think, though, if when we are thinking about policy and we're thinking about how Plan S fits into the books or books fit into Plan S, um, then we have to recognise those disciplinary differences and make it a policy that's driven by AHSS, Arts and Humanities Scholars. Um, there are some really interesting things that have kind of cropped up today, particularly around um, incentives. Again, this is something that has been discussed over the last 12 months. You know, what incentives are there for authors to publish open access? Um, what incentives are there for people to think about um, alternative approaches to publishing? Um, you know, we, we had a very brief discussion yesterday around when I asked a question about open access books and what this, what this looks like for Plan S. Um, and, you know, yes, book processing charges might be one approach, but it's not the only approach. And I think just because something is familiar doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only way to go forward. Um, so I think almost untying some of that familiarity that we have with APCs and journal articles would be a good way to kind of go forward. Um, I think it's also interesting as well that we've mentioned that they're going to have the Plan S will provide guidelines for monographs in 2021. Um, I suppose then thinking about what that means for actual the date of policy implementation, that still to me hasn't been made clear and I think that would be useful for, for clarity on that. Um, again, that's something we're looking at in UKRI and understanding so as policy implementation dates, um, who that applies to in terms of their award and contract, but also understanding actually the lead time between policy implementation and actually when a book is published. And again, that relatively long period of time for a researcher to carry out their research, six, seven years. Um, I suppose, what steps can we take now to, to realise open research in the long term? That was quite a long answer, sorry. No, it's, it's good, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, so, I, in, in terms of 
um, this, this two-year waiting period, you can say that it's uh, uh, something we, we need, because as it was already mentioned by Jeroen um, and also by Tobias, uh, we need to um, engage with scholars, uh, uh, particularly in humanities and social sciences. We need to uh, start talking to institutions and to have them play a role in this transition as well, take institutional leadership, as Helen said. And my question to you now is, um, what else must we do? Leading to plan S. Just thinking out loud, I'm, I'm just reading um, the, and, and yeah, it's, it's not available to the, to the, to the audience, but um, recommendations for libraries. And there's one point, encourage the conversion of ebook packages to open access, such as via library consortia. Thinking out loud, um, why, uh, we, we, we are all focusing on transformative agreements. We don't have a clear sense now what, it, what that exactly means. Um, but can we transpose this, this idea of, no, yeah, big deal, I, I won't say the, the, the word, but um, this transformative agreements for book packages within the context of Plan S? Just, I'm seeing this sentence and it, 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 it interests me, but. Maybe just to answer directly to the sentence. <laughs> um, the, the idea was to, to, to look at what is happening uh, in the landscape mm -hmm. and in the markets and uh, realize that there is a similar development of locking in and getting this into these recommendations to be aware of it, to have it in there, to realize people and to point to this, this is happening, we have to take this into account, maybe we should avoid this. Okay. And um, regarding Plan S, I think we will, uh, and the way forward for books, we will need to um, reach out to a large number of individual communities publishing books. Again, <laughs> coming back to um, the diversity. A lot of business models uh, being used, a lot of business models and um, services by publishers being um, appreciated by, by authors. And um, we, we have a, a risk of minimizing the diversity if we take a wrong stance. And there will be a lot of backlash when it comes to books. Rightfully so. Okay. I'm just supposed just to add to the comments already made, um, engaging with, as was learned, societies and subject associations to dispel um, anxieties and concerns about open access books at a very local level. Um, so for example, thinking about the lack of um, author knowledge about licensing, uh, thinking about um, myth-busting around peer review and open access. Some people seem to still think that it doesn't exist, which is completely untrue. Um, and also disentangling this digital scholarship and open access scholarship, which can be two very different things. And some people think, oh, if I publish open access, you know, what, uh, what impact will this have on um, academic career progression, recruitment, but actually you still get that, the physical book, so that shouldn't be perceived as a problem. Digital scholarship and as the assessment of digital scholarship, I think maybe panellists might require, um, so interview panellists might require some sort of guidance on how to um, assess digital scholarship, but that's kind of almost in a different realm to open access. Thanks. I'd like to add one point here, that is that we need to know more about the numbers. So we've seen great examples now from data being um, collected in, in the UK and some, some stuff that's been done in the Netherlands, but actually we know very little about books, about the type of books being published, about the numbers, uh, about monitoring the process towards open access in the last uh, few years. And, and if we don't know that, it's very difficult to formulate policies that will be effective. Um, are there any questions in, in the room? Robert. Uh, so, Robert Carley from the Wellcome Trust and uh, Coalition S. So, let me just manage some expectations here. I'm not going to say anything about uh, what we said in our guidance, so there'll be something by the end of 2021. But one thing you haven't 
addressed. And one of the things we, we hear a lot at the welcome is does have a, a book pol you know, open access book policy is around um, licenses for images. And there's a, there's a, an open access gets caught up in the debate and actually the real problem is uh, picture libraries not understanding the difference between a print run and online. And the fact is open access is, is a red herring. So you've spoken a lot about the need to work closely and you talked about libraries. Does that include picture libraries and trying to get, because often you, with humanities research, the images they are posting or they wish to include are owned by national libraries and national galleries. And they've got this sort of inherent contradiction where on the one hand they're trying to monetize things and on the other hand they're trying to like improve scholarship. And isn't there a, a you know, for, for an image on the web, we don't need a great big fat 50 meg TIFF file which can go on a London bus, which is what many picture libraries are worried about because they want to monetize that. We just want a reasonably low quality image for the, for the web. So is there any way, you know, amongst yourselves, you can like get a coalition of picture libraries to take this forward? Because I think if, without the images, a lot of the humanities research, it doesn't really make that much sense. And, the, and I think the, the lack of images, you know, the lack of being able to address how you put an image into an open access book is absolutely is hindering this development. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, in that case, I want to thank all of you and thank the panel.